So hello to everybody and to those that joined us yesterday, welcome back. And for the people that are joining us fresh today, thanks for taking the time to be with us. As you're likely aware, today is the second out of three webinars that we're hosting on Vibrios um, that is being brought to you by the team at Safefish. Again, for those that don't know me, my name is Natalie Dowsett and I'm the Executive Officer of Safefish, which is a program that supports safety and market access for Australian seafood. Joining us again today is our Program Manager, Alison Turnbull, who will shortly provide you with an overview of what we discussed in the webinar yesterday as well as go through the speakers and the content that we'll be touching on today. Again, in the spirit of reconciliation, I, on behalf of Safe Fish, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Thank you for joining us and I'll hand over to Alison to begin. Thank you, Natalie. So welcome everyone. And for those of you who are joining for the first time today, I'd like to make a quick introduction to Safe Fish, the program that's brought this webinar series to you. So Safe Fish is a long-standing program that successfully supported the seafood industry um, in seafood safety and market access for over a decade now. We're funded from a wide range of industry stakeholders and the Australian government through the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Our work program is overseen by a partnership of regulators, seafood industry, research organisations. And it's this partnership approach that is really the key to the, to the strength of the program and the successes that we've had so far. We focus on high priority issues for the Australian seafood industry, working on the knowledge that an outbreak or an illness in any particular type of seafood will affect sales and market access for a much broader range of seafood, if not all seafood. Okay, so one of the issues that we're currently working on is Vibrios. Vibrios specifically in bivalves, and that's because we've had a recent uh, increase in illness statistics around Vibrio parahemolyticus in particular. So what I've got here is a high level summary of Vibrio parahemolyticus, or as DJ calls it, VP, illnesses associated with Australian bivalves. And this table only includes states that have VP as a notifiable foodborne illness. You can see that we've had illness in all of these states. Um, it's a recent phenomenon. There is very little illness before this. Most importantly, it's commonly associated with oysters. It has been traced back to all of the major oyster producing states, New South Wales, Tasmania and South Australia, and potentially also from WA. So it's a problem for all states in Australia and it's something that we really need to start getting our head around. So yesterday um, we had a, a great talk from DJ on this, um, Dorothy Jean McCubrey, and I'd like to introduce her today. She's an international consultant with a long-standing history in shellfish quality assurance. She's worked with the Australian shellfish industry on many issues ranging from viruses, biotoxins and market access. She's also worked with the FAO and the US FDA and completed her PhD on food safety science governance using vibriosis as an exploratory lens. DJ will take us through today what we can practically do to reduce the risk of Vibrio in oysters. And this will follow on from her informative seminar that we had yesterday on the science of Vibrios. So I won't uh, steal DJ's thunder by repeating what she said yesterday because I know she's going to start today with a recap of that science. After DJ, we will then move to Dan Roden. So Dan Roden runs Taz Clean Water Oysters, which is a thriving business in Malting Bay in the northeast of Tasmania. Dan will take us through uh, firsthand his experiences as a grower who had to deal with what was then an unknown issue in Australia, the first um, outbreak in VP associated with oysters in 2016. So he'll talk about what happened in that first outbreak how it impacted his business and what changes he has had to make. Then we'll hear um, from Owen Hunt from Biosecurity Tasmania. And I know Owen will be very pleased with that photograph there. That's a, a rather young looking Owen, <laughs> but um, the same Owen nonetheless. So 
Owen will bring in the comments to the table uh, from the regulatory perspective. We've tried to leave lots of time for our audience to question our panel. Please don't be shy. This is a unique opportunity for you to find out information from people who have lived through it and are still adapting to this relatively new problem for Australia. So with that, I'm going to pass on to you, DJ. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much for that. And thank you, everybody, for coming back again. Hey, Graham, I see on your chat line that overnight you've got an extra question for me. Please hold that question. I promise I won't forget it. We'll address it at the end of the session. But maybe in my talk today, I might um, help you answer the question. But let's come back to it later on. Um, very quick recap from yesterday. I don't want to bore you with the same details, but I just want to draw out for those who you who were listening yesterday what my key messages were. And I realise that not everybody who is attending today attended yesterday. So like tapping into Coronation Street, I'll give you a quick summary um, so that we can start together on the same page. Um, yesterday, I wanted to stress to you that each of us has a different role to play in the VP scene, whether we're a scientist, a regulator, or an industry person. And that means each of us has our own unique professional risk associated with VP. If you're a scientist and suddenly on a late Friday afternoon, somebody rings up and says there's lots of illnesses, you want to have the professional competence that you can run the assays, etc. Um, a regulator, the same, he's got to front up to the media and deal with the, the um, moaning public, etc. And the industry has to give their customers the trust that they know what they're about and selling them safe food. So it's the same with any other product thing. VP is no different. So yesterday I wanted to um, give people the view that VP or Vibrio Parahemolyticus and I chose to call it VP because Vibrio Parahemolytica is such a mouthful on this um, webinar. VP is everywhere. It's in all the oceanic environments around the world, in the tropical areas which are warmer. It'll be there all year round in abundant numbers in the water. In the cooler temperate climates, it is more prevalent in the summertime, but in the wintertime, it just reduces its numbers and goes to sleep in the silt. And there's nothing that we can do to control it. It's a natural function of the marine world to have marine species there. Okay, um, because seafood comes from the same environment as the Vibrios live in, they are neighbours, and that's why they have an ongoing relationship with one another. It's nothing special or bad about seafood is just because they live in the same street as the Vibrio bacteria. Often shellfish is um, commonly implicated in VP illness and that's because as filter feeders they have the ability to concentrate whatever is in the water and because often oysters and other shellfish such as clams and mussels are eaten raw and that makes them a particularly um, more risky food source. But other seafoods such as um, sushi, sashimi, um, seaweed, etc., if it's eaten raw, is equally a problem. Raw seafood, simply because Vibrio are quickly killed by cooking, um, raw seafood is the more risky seafood, but cooked seafood can easily be recontaminated by seawater or by being stored with raw um, seafood. VP, as I mentioned, is in tropical and temperate waters, but we don't normally see human VP illnesses when the sea water temperature is less than 15 degrees. And that's because the VP are becoming less predominant in the seawater and they're hunkering down into the silts um, for, to hibernate for winter. They're also normally more associated with brackish water. It's unusual to get them in high numbers in very oceanic salty waters, like waters above 33 parts per thousand. And intertidal shellfish is a risk feature, and I'll explain more about why that's the case um, as we go along. My key messages from yesterday is no matter how smart we human beings think we are, we have no way of eliminating VP from the oceans of the world. It's impossible. So our critical control point cannot be at the ocean. 
very important to understand that not all Vibrios are pathogenic. Now, science is very good now. We've got some great tests that can find Vibrios of all species, both in clinical samples, so that's fecal specimens or any other body fluid from an ill person, or environmental samples, such as seawater, shellfish, or silts. Science can very quickly assay and describe the Vibrios that are present. But sadly, at the moment, what science cannot do is predict when and where a Vibrio outbreak will occur. They're great after the facts. Again, just quickly reiterate, cooking, mild cooking very quickly kills BP bacteria. If you put them in the fridge, they'll get slowly sluggish and multiply less. And um, when frozen, they simply go to sleep. So with all that, what best practices can we actually apply so that we can put our hand on our heart and say, look, we've done the very best that we can. Yesterday, I explained that VP are everywhere, they're all around the world. Um, and they have been for at least the 1950s, probably before that. But in the 1950s, Japan was the first country to identify people eating partially cooked sardines who were suffering from diarrhea. Since then, we have documented cases of BP associated with seafood eating all around the world. Um, so it is a significant problem. And nowadays, BP is considered to be the most common microbial illness associated with eating seafood around the world. Now, because we have a global problem, doesn't mean we all have the same problem. Let me explain. Every place in the world, and even in the country, has a slightly different jigsaw puzzle. Each of us has our own physical environment, for example, the top of the New Zealand is much warmer than the cold um, Stewart Island waters. Um, we have different industry practices. For example, my talk yesterday and today will often focus on aquacultured shellfish. But we need to remember that not all seafood is farmed. A lot of it is dredged from the wild and that has a different nature or industry practices associated with it, which brings a different set of risks. We have different dietary customs. If I um, took you to Japan and explained the VP problem, interestingly, oysters hardly ever feature in their illness problems. Um, they have more problems associated with sushi and sashimi. So um, there are differences. And of course, you, then we bring people into the mix and that adds another dimension. And around the world, people prepare their food differently and they have different cultural expectations around food safety. I'm not going to be labor on that last point too much until we come back next week to decide what's best for Australia. But those four key things interact in different ways and they will interact differently around the different states of Australia where you have different climates, you have different species um, and you've got different folk. Yesterday, Phil Baker and Anthony were quick to point out to me, oh, we've got special oysters that behave quite differently to everybody else's and I don't disbelieve you at all. Everybody's seafood is special, and that brings the interesting flavour to risk management practices. They will differ from place to place. Wherever you are, when you are thinking about best practice, you need to take into account your local environment, your local people and your industry practices, and then apply these factors to your situation. What is the best science that you have? And do you need to find out some new science information? Yesterday, we heard that Sydney rock oysters seem to survive incredibly well when they're taken out of the water, and that's fine. Um, that particular industry has some very good science to show that VP grows slowly in those oysters. So use good science around your own particular situation. Um, you'll need to apply the best managers 
practices that apply to your local area. And this won't be new to you. You already have shellfish programs that deal with other features like microbial pollution, marine biotoxins. So it's not a new dimension for you to think about. And then, of course, you have to make it practical and workable. So what does best management practice look like? And again, I'm really um, quickly mentioning something that I introduced yesterday. It's not just throwing the problem at the farmer. It's a bit wider than that. It takes a team effort of professionals to um, solve any food safety issues. And it's going to be the same for BP. We'll talk to the um, Tasmanian group a little bit later on who have experience in dealing with this. But I've travelled around many of your states and visited your shellfish offices, and I know that you are used to dealing with these management issues. OK, we talked before that it's impossible to eliminate that. We need to accept that straight out. And there will be occasions that come out of left field when totally unexpected, you will be exposed to a VP illness outbreak. As I mentioned, science is not good at predicting where and when they will happen. And in New Zealand, I've been harping on to the oyster industry for years that they're going to have a problem which has yet to occur. And yet out of the green shell mussels, which I would have expected would have a less risk, they have had illnesses associated. So be prepared that the natural environment is in control of itself and we don't have a lot of control over it. I mentioned yesterday, for anybody who wasn't here yesterday, that I could solve all your problems really, really quickly. If you give me all the stock that you pull out of the water, we have a number of food technology processes that we could apply and quickly remove all living BP out of your shellfish. Sadly, all of those recipes would change the nature of your shellfish, either the taste or something about them and likely your consumers would not want them because what consumers really want today is unprocessed natural food so probably that's not what you want to hear from me remember when the temperature is between 20 and 25 degrees vibrios are one of the fastest multiplying organisms that we know of and they will multiply and multiply again and again on a logarithmic scale every 27 minutes so you'll quickly have areas, you have high numbers. Now what I'm going to do now is talk to you about what other countries are doing to manage the risks. Many countries have had a VP problem for a long time. So I'm going to expose you to some of the practices that the shellfish farming industries overseas are doing, not just the shellfish farmers, but the shellfish harvesters are doing overseas. Some of these may be practical and useful for you to know about, but others you may say, well, that's just not suitable for our particular industry, and that is fine. At least I've led you down some ideas. Some countries which have a chronic VP problem choose to select their harvesting time. If they know that their VP problem is a summertime problem, they may well choose to ignore harvesting during that season and stick to harvesting their whole batch in the less risky time. So they simply avoid the season when the VP is there. Other shellfish farmers literally shift their farms. Now, what do I mean by that? Some of them pick up their whole farm or drag it by tractor or, or by boat to a brand new situation. They take it out to deeper, colder and saltier waters. That may not be practical for you. In here in New Zealand, we classify each lease and not the wider oceanic water. So to shift your farm like that would be actually illegal from an environmental point of view and from a food safety point of view, but it is something that other countries do. Further, they don't just shift them across the water. In Alaska, they've actually found that when they have a VP problem, they choose to drop their muscle lines lower into the water because lower in the water is colder and they have found that that promptly solves the problem. If they drop the uh, muscles 
to an area in the water space that is less than 15 degrees, the problem goes away. Okay, farming operations. When it comes to farming, farmers do have a lot more control over their product than if you're a wild harvester who has to stay outside all day dredging and dredging till you find enough product to take home. Farmers have more control over their product and like a shepherd, they can bring them into the mustering yards and sort them and grade them and then send them back out to grow further. Um, the oyster industry particularly does this, but I am aware that other shellfish such as the mussels and the clams also sometimes shift their product from paddock to paddock. What you need to be aware is that when you bring the shellfish to shore, the shellfish, of course, close tightly and no longer are filtering outside of the water, which means that any vibrio inside the shellfish, if the temperature is warm, they'll just be doubling and doubling and the shellfish won't be able to spit them back out until you put them back in the water. Some of the operations such as rumbling and sizing or scraping barnacles, etc., can be quite stressful to the shellfish. So we highly recommend that when you put them back into the water, that you give them some time to get back to reality and start to filter. We would recommend at least two tidal cycles before you harvest them for commercial eating. Um, it's a stressful time, but they will settle down again. Yesterday, um, Deb asked me more about depuration, and I said depuration in live concrete tanks doesn't work very well, but depuration in the natural environment does work well, and that's what we call relay. And when I talked about the shellfish farmers shifting their product to colder or saltier water, that's what we would call a relay process where the shellfish then naturally depurate and spit out the VP organisms. More than relaying, some farmers in other countries realise that even the process of harvesting from the intertidal zone exposes them to a risk of VP having grown, um, growing significantly. And tomorrow, oh, next week, we're actually going to have a farmer from um, British Columbia who is very used to the um, problems over there and he's going to talk to you more about the nightmares that they've had with VP and some of the options that they do. But over there, what they do is they harvest the shellfish in the intertidal zone or when the tide is out and then they put them in baskets and they put them on a big barge and take them out to deeper water and plop them overnight into the seawater so that they have at least 12 hours of re-cleansing and then they go out with the barge and crane the oysters out of the deep water. Again, might not be practical for you, but I'm just letting you know what other people do. Okay, those are the things that you might be able to do in the farm um, on the water, appreciating full well that you don't have control over the VP. All you have control over is the water the salinity and the temperature. So what happens when you come to harvesting? Again, as I mentioned, you have the option of saying, well, oh, I'm not going to harvest at that particular time. Or even if you get some low level noise of a problem, you might choose not to harvest from that area and you might choose to select from another of your growing areas if you have the option to do so. So it's just a matter of thinking about your harvesting and where is the best place to lower your risk. Another thing that people do overseas, and in fact, in some situations, the regulator forces the industry to do, is some kind of harvesting curfew. This means that industry are allowed to harvest at a certain time of the day, but not at others. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, where it's really quite warm, the idea is to get out, get your product in early. Get it in before 10 o'clock in the morning, before the temperature, the daytime temperature starts to rise. Or alternatively, later in the afternoon as the temperatures reduce. Another harvesting curfew that is often in place overseas is if you have 
intertidal oysters which are coming out of the water to harvest them just as they're coming out of the water rather than waiting until they've had the full tidal cycle. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next slide. Um, the industry really has control of its own product and particularly the aquaculture area. You have more controls than the wild harvester. By that, I mean you can choose your time to harvest your shellfish and line up everything else about the system to get it to the market in the best possible condition. Often you will have control over what time the refrigerated truck arrives to pick up your product. Sometimes you won't, but it's worth thinking about how can I do my operation in a seamless way to reduce my risk where the product is exposed to warm temperatures. Many years ago, when I was the shellfish specialist, we had oyster farmers way up in the far north, and their courier only came once a day to pick up their product. So because they were farmers, they used to pick up the product and they used to put it by the side of the road, ready for the courier to come and collect. Why it didn't get stolen, I don't know. But the, honestly, the farmers did that in good faith, not realising that their whole bacterial flora would increase dramatically. So we had oysters with high standard plate counts and we investigated what was wrong. And that was the problem, is they were let, being left outside in a warm condition where the shelves were shut and the oysters could no longer filter and therefore the bacteria were growing promptly. Um, so just things to think about as you set up your harvesting operation. I mentioned about the intertidal operation. The things that I'm talking about, there are actually lots of scientific references behind the thinking to prove that it actually works because most things have been tested overseas. But we know that the intertidal thing, when the shelves close and the um, oysters or clams are outside of the water, sitting on the substrate in the sun, the levels of um, VP will go up enormously and we've found that they can go up to four to eight times the number um, than before when the oyster was um, filter feeding. So just be aware of that. The longer you leave them outside in the sun, particularly if you have the bags on the actual ground, which they do in many countries, rather than hanging from a rack, and if the ground is black rock, the numbers will escalate. And that's why I mentioned intertidal species can have a, a different risk profile than say green shell mussels, which are on a long dropper constantly in the subtidal condition. Harvesting vessels. Anybody who's involved in seafood will find it fascinating to read the stories about their particular product. But oysters is one food which seems to have a whole romance and history around it. And um, in Chesapeake Bay, which is over in Washington, they even produce particular yachts called skipjack yachts so that the people who dredged their oysters in the 1800s, they could fly back to market as quickly as possible and get their oysters on the marketplace first up and get the best price for them. And they still have skipjack races in Chesapeake Bay. But we have advanced a long way from the single man um, harvesting boat. And nowadays overseas, the muscle bar or the harvesting barges can be huge. But the key things are that protecting them from the sun, um, protecting the product from sunlight. Some barges overseas will have refrigerator units on, and some will even have ice slurries, which is in the top right hand side. That means pulling his oysters on board and dumping them straight away into a seafood ice slurry to reduce the temperatures down very quickly. So there are a multitude of types of um, barges out there or harvesting operations. And I realize that yours might differ completely from those. Um, whatever size you have, and I know some oyster farmers who have such a small barge, it's just a little pontoon that they push around while they walk around their oyster farm. People's operations differ. But what I would suggest is if you're harvesting, particularly in the summertime, 
shade your shellfish from direct sun. Make sure you have good circulation around it. Think about things that can keep your product cool and please stick to that. None of this is rocket science. I realize that. These are things that you as an industry are well aware of outside of BP. These are things which will make sure that the quality of your seafood remains in prime condition and things that you are already required to do by the Shellfish Sanitation Programme. Of course, any food chain is a chain of events and production is just the first step in the chain and to get your product to the marketplace has a number of other people who have to take responsibility and ownership of your product but it's your name that ends up on the final product. This slide here I've actually stolen from um, Oyster Farmers Best Practice Guide, but it's simply reminding you of the different places along the food chain. That, um, and again, because um, time is short, you're, please just remind your transporters what precious cargo they are transporting. And if they um, have other cargo online, not to just put yours on the pavement while they sort other people's product, et cetera, that um, it's really important that people take care of your product and deliver it in a sound condition. And it's the same for your wholesalers, your retailers, your processors, whether your product goes into a wet well at a supermarket or whether it's placed on ice, please take ownership and visit your product along the way and see what happens to it. And then, of course, you get to the last person who's the first person to make the complaint and often is the person who takes the least care, your customer. Um, let's be frank, there are some customers who possibly should not be eating raw protein of any description because of their own health status. Um, if a person is immunocompromised, we would not recommend that they eat raw seafood, raw eggs or raw meat. You can tell people that, but that doesn't mean that they will listen. And I always remember talking to a man in the United States who had suffered VP and um, suffered Vibrio vulnificus, which we talked about yesterday, had his leg amputated because of it. And I asked him if he had changed his behaviour. And he said, hell no, life is about living and I like my raw oysters. It's my individual right to eat my oysters and drink my beer. Go away, lady, I don't want to hear your message. And um, that's the reality. Customers can make their choice, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and give them the message about how to look after them and your product well. Okay. Which leads me to our best management guide that I asked you to perhaps have a quick look at last night. I need to admit to a vested interest in this guide because I had some um, participation in its production. Um, a couple of years ago, OT visited me because they had had illness cases associated with oysters and they wanted to do the best that they could. They went along and tried to find out lots of information about VP and they found some of it was difficult to find and some of it was complicated to read. So they asked my help to give them some messages, which I did. They then took my words away and translated them into common sense language and got their um, industry people to help. Um, I've stolen some of their pictures today from that particular guide but I really thought today I know everybody out there will have their own views as to what's best from them but I thought you might be interested to hear more from the um, Oyster Tasmanian group who put that together and their experience in dealing with it so we're going to have two people to give their comments Jan Roden is an industry person who suffered the consequences of VP illness I understand and then after Dan has spoken, we're going to talk to Owen, who's the regulator, a man after my own heart, because I've sat in his chair and I know how difficult it is on a Friday afternoon when the phone rings and you've got either the press or a restaurant claiming that product that you're responsible for kills illness. So, Dan, are you out there? Sorry, Dan, you're just on mute. Yep, sorry, I just realised then. 
So I've opened it up. Yep, I'm here. Are you ready, me? Are you ready for me to take over straight up? I'll just get to your slides. There we go. We've got a few prompting questions here for Dan, but please feel free to just give us your um, thoughts, opinions, and experience. Uh, thank you, Alison. Yeah, listen, um, I'll just give a little bit of a background to what happened in our particular situation, and then I'll um, I'll go through and I'll essentially follow the uh, the questions and prompts that Alison's put on the screen. Uh, essentially, um, on the fourth of the second, two thousand sixteen, we got a call from. Um, uh, Owen Hunt indicating that we had a potential Vibrio outbreak. <clears throat> um, we quickly ascertained what we had in the marketplace. Uh, we didn't have a lot of knowledge at that stage. And, and to be honest, we were right in the midst of a, a POMS outbreak in Tasmania. So um, it wasn't an ideal timing. And um, I'm a little vague on some of um, uh, the actual intricacies and details of the, um, of the recall. Uh, but I'll do my best to uh, to give you the information. So essentially, on the fourth of the second, we were notified. By the fifth of the second, we actually issued, um, initiated a um, a trade recall of all product that was in the market. I identified uh, the time frame from health was all stock that was um, that had been harvested from the thirteenth of the first to the twenty seventh of the first, which was quite a lot in January, um, considering it was our peak harvest season. So we had approximately um, uh, just over 18,000 dozen oysters in the marketplace uh, up the entire eastern seaboard of Australia. Um, we weren't notified until the 4th of the second because there is a long delay between obviously the, the illness being uh, obviously one, oysters getting to the market, um, that then going from the wholesaler to the restaurant and then the consumer, then the illness, the illness being reported, and then the um, I guess the tracking and tracing of that product back to the farm. So the first illness was reported on the 16th of 1st when it was tracked back, um, but we weren't actually notified until the 4th of the 2nd. So we uh, we proceeded with the recall the very next day. Um, so yeah, look, a nervous wait certainly as an oyster farmer, we had potentially around about $150,000 worth of product um, that was out in the marketplace at that particular stage. Uh, in the end, we had um, around about four, just over 4,000 dozen of those oysters were recovered um, and destroyed. Uh, a portion of that stock was all tested. Uh, we tested stock in Tasmania on the farm and also as far as some frozen product that was still in uh, Queensland. But all of that particular product was actually actually came back negative. Uh, so um, we, uh, we assumed at that particular stage that the majority of the illnesses which was associated between the 16th and the 1st and the 19th and the 1st was probably from the harvest on the 13th and the 1st. But, um, you know, hindsight, we could look back and reflect on that. Um, at, the st at that stage, we had to essentially uh, recall and destroy all product. Uh, so uh, for me, in terms of a farmer, we lost approximately about $50,000 worth of, um, of product during that time. Uh, and uh, it was certainly, you know, incredibly stressful and um, a significant impost and financial, um, uh, you know, um, dispensation to uh, to our business. So it was a really costly exercise. So we didn't know a lot about Vibrio. We hadn't experienced it before. Um, it was really new to Tasmania. Uh, the idea of clean green water pretty much went out the uh, out the window, and we had to start um, investigating and working with um, Owen and his team to come up with some of the immediate solutions. So uh, what were the impacts of the events, including costs? I've sort of went through that just briefly. Um, managing risks, uh, Owen came up and did a literature research um, of uh, the current information that he could access. He came up and had a meeting with farmers and we looked at what we believed we could adopt immediately in terms of trying to reduce our impact um, and uh, try and reduce the uh, potential risk of, uh, of Vibrio. Um, we didn't have any background data on, um, on the bay, so um, Owen immediately started a, um, a bacterial uh, testing regime um, from several sites around the bay so we can get an understanding of the problem. Uh, we, as a, um, as a, a farming group, um, adopted the policy which seemed to be the you know, general consensus, which was to reduce the time from harvest to cool chain. So uh, we, we adopted that process immediately. Uh, for my particular farm, we could have anywhere between seven hours and, and maybe within 24 hours, bringing that product under 10 degrees, which was part of our food safety management system. We reduced that on farm for Taz Clean Water Oysters. We reduced that to four and a half hours. That was our immediate response. Um, so we, we just changed the way that we harvest and, and 
put more resources both on the boats and on our harvest team to get that product in as quickly as we possibly could and to get that product processed and into our chiller. We were very lucky that we were one of the farmers that already had a chiller on site so that we could actively get our product um, underneath the, um, uh, the 10 degrees in the shortest possible time frame. Uh, along with that, um, you know, we identified some of the um, on-farm issues that we could do. We, we shut down um, areas that we couldn't control. So we, we closed down our door sales immediately because we couldn't control our, um, our post-harvest um, and chill requirements um, uh, in that particular circumstances. We had a lot of tourists who were taking product and essentially putting it in cars. So we stopped that immediately. We stopped all unrefrigerated um, transport of our stock leaving the farm. Um, so we made that a priority that all stock that, that, that left had to go in um, refrigerated trucks. Uh, we also uh, we shifted away initially from uh, any of our intertidal harvesting. Um, the, some of the processes around that we were aware with respect to being able to be there right at that very moment where they come out of water. We just felt at that particular stage we weren't across that enough. So we shifted all of our, um, all of our sales to our deep water lease and we proceeded from there. Um, which also meant that we could work any time of the day as well. We weren't affected by tide, so we could work those, um, essentially get all our product harvested in the morning and all processed in the chiller by the afternoon, uh, which meant we were harvesting at the, um, uh, the lowest temperature in the day. So that was pretty much what we did with respect to our immediate response based on the information that we worked with um, Owen. We came up with a uh, Vibrio addendum, which was um, essentially, it was, um, I guess Dorothy used it as a, uh, said like a harvest curfew, which was kind of essentially what we adopted in terms of just a protocol based on water temperature, air temperature, and reducing time from harvest to our um, uh, getting into our uh, cold chain. So that, that was really in terms of what our um, uh, immediate impacts was. Long term, after we had an opportunity for the dust to settle and um, Owen came back through the winter, we reviewed what we had adopted over that uh, summer period. We reviewed some of the testing results which were coming out of the bay. Uh, they were quite alarming and I, I think it was interesting from a farmer's perspective to see really high levels of, of Vibrio. Uh, which we were still getting uh, late into um, in, into February and early March. Um, what was uh, what I found fascinating there, and, and probably couldn't comprehend at the time, is that even though we had continued really high levels, uh, we we didn't actually see any further Vibrio outbreaks that year. Um, it was a very warm year in, um, on the east coast of Tasmania. It was probably the warmest year they had in the last you know ten years. The East Australian current had pushed right down. Um, and we had prolonged warm temperatures, dry periods, followed by increased rainfall. So that was our particular outbreak occurred after an extended drought followed by heavy rain. Uh, whether there was anything associated with that, we're, you know, we're certainly not sure. Um, and it hasn't happened subsequently, so we, we haven't got any data on that. But we certainly had really high levels of Vibrio in the bay. And after we changed our and or modified our harvesting behaviours, even though we had those high levels um, in our animals, we didn't see any further um, uh, our Vibrio outbreaks in the marketplace. So I think we felt at that stage that we certainly had found a way to um, uh, to reduce the risk of Vibrio. So we met with Owen, and then um, you know what you've seen now is with the OT document. That's been you know um, a document which has been developed in the last two years out of some of that initial work and continued testing, which we were certainly involved in. Uh, long term, if I looked at the long term changes for our um, our farm, uh, deep water, we we uh, on our deep water lease uh, we use buoys to float our gear. Um, our lease ranges between four and seven meters deep uh, across the lease. Uh, during summer, we predominantly have triploids on our farm and triploids are much heavier. And what we noticed was that we were about a metre deeper in the water column in summer than we were normally because of the, um, the heavier fish. So the first thing we did was decided to try and get the fish further off the bottom, away from the bottom. There was some, um, some data there that I want to present that um, fish being close to the sediment may be more prone to vibrio. So we raised our heights of our, of our deep water. So we put more buoys. So we made an investment of around about $15,000 worth of buoys to raise um, essentially more flotation meant that they were sitting higher in the water column. So 
that was one of the steps that we took um, in the long-term approach. We also used to, um, and still do, we air dry our stock. Um, our rotation is that we were on the deep for around about five weeks and then we'd bring our stock in and we'd air dry it for two days to kill off the fouling. Uh, now, obviously, those two days, as you would have heard in Dorothy's talk, you know, two days of sitting on shore in the middle of summer um, was probably part of the reason, um, we're assuming it was, a part of the reason why um, our, uh, our particular um, oysters had elevated levels of Vibrio. So um, we then put in a policy in place on farm to make sure that the product was coming in and being air dried for two days. When that went back out, we were now leaving that for a minimum of two weeks um, to make sure that they had an opportunity to purge and depurate. Uh, and we found that to be uh, you know, very successful. Certainly our farm hasn't experienced any issues with Vibrio since the initial outbreak. Uh, on our um, intertidal farm, we also raised our heights. We found that our gear, um, our floating gear, or hanging gear in particular, was very close to the sediment. So we've um, uh, put in a significant investment in raising our racks. Um, now, this can be counterintuitive because sometimes there's an argument that you're getting it higher in the water column, you're getting higher temperatures, which, yes, we understand. Um, but we also felt that being so close to the sediment was a risk as well. So... We felt that if we could get the, um, the baskets um, higher in the water column in cleaner water, that there's also an opportunity for them to, uh, to depurate. And our intertidal lease is uh, much closer to the ocean, so the water temperature is also cooler down there. So we've been, spent a significant investment in terms of raising our, um, our runs. We raise them around about 300 mil on average uh, to get them off the bottom. So that was certainly something that we saw as a, um, uh, a, a benefit to... Um, uh, to our farm. Uh, harvest, um, the harvest protocols that we develop now is that we've increased the staff both on the boats and on the um, on our uh, harvest machines or harvest area in our, um, uh, our computer generated, uh, sorry, it's the SED shellfish machine. So it's our automated um, shellfish harvesting machine. So it's an optical grader. We used to have three staff on that. We now have four. We also used to have two staff on the deep. We now have three. What's that effectively done is it's reduced our harvest time on the boat by around about 30 minutes and it's reduced our harvest time through the shed by around about an hour. So we can effectively get our, our product from harvest to the chiller within four and a half hours. So we, um, with Owen, we, just, uh, we came up with a protocol which was based on, I think if it's exceeded 30 degrees on the day, we needed to be um, within the, the cool chain within seven hours. Um, we've completely changed our operations so that now it doesn't matter what temperature it is, we simply um, abide by getting our product into the chiller in four and a half hours. And we felt that rather than adopting that for summer and then having a different protocol for winter, it would be hard to get into that rhythm and chop and change. So as a, um, as a business, we decided that the best way for us forward was just to adopt a best practice for um which would obviously cope with Vibrio, but it was something we could adopt and maintain for the entire year. So we were very lucky that we were in a position to be able to do that. So essentially all of our product is in the cool chain within four and a half hours. We used to night harvest. So we used to come in and do a harvest uh, late in the afternoon and uh, we would leave that sitting on shore and then we would harvest that first thing in the morning. Um, we don't do that anymore. So we've stopped all night harvests. We essentially do two harvests, one at 7.30 and one at 10.30, the two harvests. It's very regimented now. Um, and, um, you know, unless there is uh, particular conditions we can't get out, um, then, you know, pretty much on, on a regular basis, there are two harvest times. And that way we find that we can have all of our product processed in the chiller by the end of the day. Any product that can't actually be graded by that time, we actually put in the chiller ungraded, so it's already chilled as well. Um, so that's part of the process that we've certainly adopted in order to be able to, um, I guess, just reduce the risk of, uh, of Vibrio in, on our particular farm. Um, the, other, um, the other one that we have done is we're preparing now is that we're preparing our harvest where we um, receive the product from the farm. We're now making some modifications to our shed so that we're going to essentially put a wall in. So now where we... Uh, we put our product in at the moment, it's an ambient temperature. We're, we're now constructing a cool room where we can receive that product and that product can be chilled. So that particular area will be set between 10 and 15 degrees. So essentially what we can do is have a staged uh, chilled production will come off the farm. 
it'll go into where we start harvesting it. That'll sit at below 15 degrees, and then from there it'll go into the chiller, which currently sits between 5 and 8 degrees. So, again, we're just trying to have to make sure that we can do the best that we can do in terms of controlling the temperature of our product or get it under control under that 15 degrees as soon as possible. So it's another significant investment, but we're, we, we believe that for us, you know, the, the cost of having another $50,000 uh, potential problem or recall is worth investing that money to be able to make sure that essentially for us, we're looking to be able to get that product under a controlled um, environment with under 15 degrees within about two and a half hours and, and we think for that for us that's based on the evidence that we've seen is probably best practice for what we can do on our farm at this particular stage. Uh, we've also been um, um, uh, involved in a, a depuration program which has been happening up here in St Helens which we've been watching really closely and working with another farmer Craig Lockwood to also have a look at how that can potentially um, add value to our business uh, over time um, and, and whether that can be something that we can incorporate into our business down the track. We're very proud as a company that we've had this outbreak. Um, we've certainly worked hand in hand with, um, with government and the health department to be able to develop the protocol, which we've seen a really positive result now for uh, the last five years. We haven't had an outbreak on our farm since 2016. And um, I think that's about... It, isn't it? What else have I got? What impact on the business have done that? Uh, what Vibrio uh, problems are unresolved? Uh, look, I think for me, looking at it, um, the thing that we I struggled or grappled with, with is that the um, there is some data out there from Fazant with recommendations in terms of the levels which you should be closed at. Um, what I saw initially in the very first year is that we exceeded those levels um, significantly at, at, at some, at some periods of time, uh, but there was no impact with, um, uh, with uh, an illness in the marketplace. It didn't seem to be a definite link between numbers and what was happening out in um, uh, the actual marketplace with respect to the consumption of our products. So I don't know whether our particular situation is going to be different based on what's been experienced in um, other areas around the world. But it was certainly an area that I felt that probably requires some more investigating because it just didn't, there didn't seem to be a link um, with, um, you know, whether numbers were low or high with respect to an outbreak of Vibrio. So, you know, at that stage, I guess we're looking at purely that our, uh, our post-harvest um, cool chain um, procedures are, are what are going to put us in um, good stead in terms of reducing further outbreaks. Hey, that's really excellent, Dan. Thank you very, very much. I learned a lot from that. A couple of comments. You said you thought you were clean and green. Believe me, you are still clean and green. This is nothing to do with pollution or anything. This is just a natural phenomenon. And you brought up a very good point that illnesses do not relate to Vibrio numbers in the water. And that makes it very difficult for all managers to get their head around. Um, but it's something that we must accept. Um, and of course, you are doing the best practice that fit you well. Fascinatingly, in Alaska, they're dropping their product in the water while you're spending money to raise the product in the water. Yes. But you're doing what works for you, and that's the important thing, and it appears to have worked. Hey, Owen, would you like to tell us why it's a frantic exercise to try and deal with some of these pathogens as a food safety regulator, and whether the best management practice guide aided you in any way when dealing with the industry. Absolutely. Thanks, DJ. And thanks, Dan. Um, that was fantastic. Um, what, is, well, what I have to say to start with is it's been a real journey, this uh, Vibrio issue. Um, and most of all, I'd like to um, point out something that DJ said in her presentation. It needs to be a team effort. Um, certainly has needed to be a team effort. It's, as a regulator, I can't sit here and um, tell people to do everything. Um, what I found with Dan and the growers in Malting Bay was that um, they were all willing to work with me. They under, it, It's been a journey for all of us, really, um, and um, I think we've achieved something out of it. Um, but, you know, the the... Vibrio management document has been fantastic. It's 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 filled a gap that um, we realised was there 
um, fairly late in the day. You know, we were focusing on the um, harvesting and um, temperature controls and so forth. And then further down the line, we started to go, well, hang on, there's a, there's a bit of a problem here. You know, we're not addressing farm management practices while the stock is still in the water and, you know, how, how the stock's managed. And then there's a big gap in the market around um, what happens with the transportation of the product, whether whether there's any um, breaks in the cool chain, you know, knowledge gaps within the processes and customers base. So the the document that was developed has filled a lot of those gaps. I, I suppose um, looking at it from a regulator's perspective, you know, I, I see a couple of other um, gaps as well and it's something that you raised as well um, DJ was the um, epidemiology the de the delays in the links back to um, the illness it's um, with Dan's case you know the product was harvested on the 13th of January and it wasn't until the 4th of February that we actually had confirmation that yes it was linked to the illnesses were linked to Tasmania and to, to Dan's growing area and then within several hours Dan and I put our heads together and um, worked out how to um, trace all of the products back and because Dan has good systems in place um, within I'm not sure, Dan, I think it was probably about six hours or so we'd worked out exactly where all the product was um, and then a recall was implemented the next day. Uh, and, that, and I must say that that recall only occurred because Dan had frozen stock in the marketplace. By that stage, all of the fresh stock had been consumed. Um, so we, we weren't exactly worrying at that stage about um, further illnesses from that harvested batch. It was it was just that frozen stock that was in the marketplace. So um, th those delays are, are significant, and it's fairly common with um, Vibrio um, parahemolyticus because of the length in time that it takes to do the testing, and then on top of that, you do all of the the health department and so forth does all the traceability. Um, and then finally gets back to me and um, I, I start taking action with the, the farmer in question. Uh, so basically what we put in place when Vibrio started um, popping up was, first off, we looked at it and went, well, how do, how do we deal with this on a, farm, on a farm or a growing area basis? So we closed the area we put in place a sampling program and um, try and get a bit of an idea of what background levels of Vibrio are in the shellfish. From there, and during that time, an investigation occurs just with the grower in question to look at all of their practices, see if there's any, um, any issues in their practices that have caused that on the farm. You know, that, that's time into cool chain, it's the water temperature, it's the uh, transportation that they use um, and general farming practices. Um, we have a process now, as part of that, the growing area is required to put in place a Vibrio control plan. Those Vibrio control plans, as Dan was saying, put in place, it is, a, is an addendum to the food safety program that each grower is required to have and it stipulates the time into the cool chain and so forth. Um, and once all, all of that is, the investigation's done and the Vibrio control plan is in place, then the harvest area is reopened and the producers can um, start their normal harvesting again and selling. Um, the um, Vibrio control plan, that is, I wouldn't exactly call it a science-based document. It's it's a document. It was a document that was put together in consultation with the um, growers in Malting Bay when the in 2016-17 when the illnesses first popped up. Um, so it came from me drawing information from all over the place, predominantly in the US, uh, looking at what 
control measures they put in place. And then there was a bit of negotiation, a, a meeting with the growers in Moulton Bay, and we kind of massaged the document to, to fit what they needed to be able to operate in the interim. Um, and then slowly over time, we've developed that document. A lot of that is with the assistance of Moulton Bay. Um, and we've, we've come up with a more formalised sort of um, Vibrio control plan. Um, at, in addition to all of that work with the, the predominantly with the farmers and doing the um, investigations, it was agreed fairly early on that this was a, this was going to be a fairly major emerging issue for the industry. So, as part of the management committee for the um, Shellfish Market Access Program, um, there was a Vibrio Management Committee, which is a subcommittee, um, was developed and. Um, that committee was there to really look at it, at these issues industry-wide in Tasmania and tried, tried it was to bring in the learnings that we had from Moulton Bay plus then trying to look at the gaps and that resulted in um, Oysters Tasmania um, picking up the ball and running with it and that's where DJ was brought in to develop the um, the, the document, the Vibrio management document that she um, put in place. So, um, yeah, I, that that's pretty much it at this point in time. We're um, we're just watching, watching and waiting to see how everything um, uh, proceeds. Where in the last um, eighteen months or so, we haven't had any illnesses. So, um, though two thousand and nineteen. Um, we had illnesses popping up, just small numbers, but um, luckily for the industry, I suppose, was the fact that most of that could be really put back to um, poor handling by the customer, um, whether it be, a, um, you know, we, 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 we've had multiple scenarios um, and a lot of it was really... Um, people buying oysters and then, you know, tourists and so forth and travelling around with them in their car and so forth. So the, the presumption was that it was a, um, a mistreating of the um, abuse of the, the product because we weren't, at the same time, we weren't seeing um, numbers increasing in, in reports from other states or anything like that. So... That, that's really good, um, Owen. Thank you very much. Some of the things that you're starting to talk about will be really useful next session and session three, where we start to think about well, what policies might we be able to use to change people's behaviour. But your um, talk there was really useful. And one of the hard things that you would have had to come up against when you had the malting bay thing it's often there's more than one farm within a growing area. So where do you draw the line around the farm? Do you suddenly close the whole bay or should you just close the bay? And I don't have an answer for you, but I understand that these are the problems when you have a natural problem, which is flowing around in the ocean current and you can't specifically point the finger at bad behaviour by one operator. So it is going to be a challenge for us. Thank you, Anne. I really appreciate your time.